So this is a session on the business roundtable. Like energy. You want to go to the government roundtable? You're in the wrong place. I wish we bought milk. We don't buy milk. No. No. Not 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 from my company. That we buy leather. And um, leather. From as much as you can, come down to the front, and we can create a more collegial atmosphere. Meat from the cow. Oh, is it from your cow? No, not from our cow. Oh, right. From the cow okay, from good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Ashton Carter. I'm with the um, Althelia Climate Fund, and we're an investment vehicle which invests into conservation and climate uh, solutions and sustainable um, landscapes. And I'm uh, chairing this meeting, this session today on the business um, roundtable. Um, so, the goal of this session, of course, the goal of the whole conference is to discuss no net loss of biodiversity and how we go about doing that. Uh, the focus of this table, while yesterday we spoke a lot about project level um, implementation and planning and case studies, um, in this session we really want to talk about the strategic level of um, corporate efforts to um, achieve a no, not, no net loss of biodiversity. Um, and so really the focus um, with the panel here today is really on what are the strategic um, goals that they set, what are the strategic management efforts they put in place, um, what are some of the tools they use to um, engage very often the kind of multi-business or multi-site um, business. And we're a bit short on time, so we're going to kind of move at quite a clip, but just to give you an idea of the format, what we're going to do is really organize a session around kind of four, four topics related to no net loss of biodiversity, which I'll introduce as we go to them. And then I'm going to ask uh, folks from the panel to talk to those points from their experience. Then I'm going to turn to the audience and ask for comments and experience and questions, and then back to the, the panel again. And hopefully we'll get a little bit of a discussion about that. And we have on the panel um, you know, people who are at different stages of their journey to um, incorporating biodiversity. Um, so not everybody's been around doing this for the last 10 years. Some have. And in the audience also we have... Um, a spread of uh, folk in the, from the business sector who've got, some have got much experience and some have got, are uh, really just beginning. So hopefully we can, you know, together, collectively, um, tease out some of, those, uh, some of those lessons and where people are and help each other um, to be a part of this, um, part of this solution. Um, so very, very quickly, um, I'm going to, uh, the panelists can introduce themselves a little bit more um, if they would like to, but um, on the panel we have um, Warwick Mostart at the end there, who is from De Vere's. He's a biodiversity manager um, at De Vere's, started in the field, um, but now dealing with uh, corporate and policy level issues as well to do with biodiversity. So impressive that De Vere's actually have a dedicated uh, staff title to biodiversity. Um, Jack Petraeus here is from Freedom Camp Campina, which is um, the head of sustainability there. That's the, the largest, uh, one of the largest uh, dairy cooperatives globally. Um, an impressive turnover, something like 11 billion euro. Uh, Jim Rushworth, uh, third from the end, um, from Lafarge, uh, the, the well-known quarrying and aggregates company, VP of Environmental Public Affairs, and sits on many different boards to do with natural capital and biodiversity. Um, Helen Crowley, three from me, um, with the, the brand company, Caring, and we're going to hear from her about managing supply chains, incorporating biodiversity um, protection into those supply chains. Uh, Dev uh, IMR from IUCN, um, who the, 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 uh, the conservation membership organization that we all know and love, and he's been doing some work on um, biodiversity offsets beyond extractives, and we're going to have a, a session on that. Uh, Sophie Le Penec is VP of Environment at the Mining and Metals Organization, Aramat. And then Mary-Eve Reinhardt, who uh, works for the, um, the research unit of IFA at EDF. So look, the first topic uh, that we wanted to discuss was uh, about uh, the corporate commitments that have been made thus far on biodiversity um, offsets or no net loss. Um, and then the business case that um, individual champions of the organization have to build um, around that. So really to start, I'm going to ask the panelists in kind of 30 seconds to tell me what they've managed to achieve in terms of their corporations 
uh, making a commitment to no net loss or biodiversity, or if in fact that's how they how they frame it. And you know, I'll, I'll start working for an investment company which is designed to that. It's quite easy for us because that's our purpose, and we have made a commitment to no net loss and um, even a net gain of biodiversity. So, um, Warwick, starting with you, how, how have you got on in De Beers in uh, articulating a corporate commitment? Thank you, Ashton. I think, uh, yeah, we, we stuck our heads up uh, above the parapet probably 2008, 2009 and, and introduced a no net loss commitment in, in our environmental policy. And I think that sort of set the, set the way and set the scene towards how we considered our biodiversity impacts right across our, our operations. And so I think that's an important uh, commitment for a company to make, is to actually bring that commitment in into policy that actually drives through, right through your biodiversity standards uh, down to you know, implementing guidelines for some of the operating units to, to bring in. So that's, that's ultimately where it started, I think, Ashton. Okay. Sophie, please. Is it Sophie in the end? Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning, everybody. So belonging to a mining and metallurgical uh, company, you can easily imagine that biodiversity aspect is of key importance for us. And uh, we started a long time ago on the field trying to implement uh, what was the core aspect of the scientific and technical <coughs> feasibility studies at that stage. And since that period of time, we have worked a lot on the field to be able to be successful to implement the vindication hierarchy. So, the offsetting approach and the non-net loss uh, is just the final step of the loop that started a long time ago. And uh, we started, started at the first step by doing on the field and being efficient and successful on the field prior to having a written uh, commitment. Now it's done, it's 30 years after, and since the last decade we have been engaged publicly with written commitments through uh, environmental charter, code of ethics, sustainable development policies, but implementing internally new managing roles and guidance to be able to manage project with the implementation of internal challenging workforce to be able to challenge the way the managing decision has have taken on board such uh, topics. And with, uh, as we shared since yesterday, those topics uh, requiring highly skilled and multiple skilled uh, competencies, we have set up external partnerships and independent bodies to be able to be supporting such issues. Okay. Jim, have you managed to have a, a corporate level goal set for um, biodiversity or natural capital? Or you yes, yeah. Um, with, with, within Lafarge, um, we've been carrying out uh, uh, re rehabilitation, uh, restoration activities since the sort of early 1970s. We have a, a, a very good example in Uganda uh, where we started to, to actually do restoration and to, um, to try and recreate the, the type of habitats that were there many, many years before, even before the, t the actual operation that uh, existed. On a corporate level, uh, back in 2000, we started a partnership with WWF, uh, and one of the initial work stream was to, was to look at biodiversity. And out of that partnership, uh, we have um, had commitments regarding to completing biodiversity management plans. Uh, the latest commitment is that we will have biodiversity management plans for all of our uh, locations, our quarries, and our cement plants around the world by 2020. We also have commitments related to rehabilitation and we'll have rehabilitation plans for all of our quarries by 2015. Uh, we're well down the way of both of those targets. Uh, and more recently, we've just uh, published our, our strategy on biodiversity, which was released on International Biodiversity Day this year. Uh, and that has two commitments. One commitment related to not entering specific protected areas, so no new quarries in certain protected areas. Uh, and also there is a commitment to develop uh, a, no, a net positive impact uh, at our at site level on our operations, looking at uh, based on a habitat uh, basis. Okay, so you do actually have a specific goal about um, habitat impact? Yes, yes. Uh, what, um, what, we, the, what the uh, biodiversity um, strategy says is that uh, over, you know, we will uh, implement a methodology that we will be able to demonstrate that uh, the habitat that existed prior to the operation and within, within a lot of our operations, it was typically intensive agricultural land. 
uh, we will uh, review what the um, intended rehabilitation project will create in terms of habitats and we'll do a comparison between the two and, tr and try and demonstrate that we have a net positive impact. Uh, uh, so that, that's, that's our commitment that uh, we've uh, just recently re released. Mary, but um, easier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, biodiversity for EDF is a key component of the um, environmental management system as uh, we have 80% of our power plants which are located less than uh, 500 meters than a natural 2,000 sites. So, uh, of course, at the, at the project level, we are applying mitigation hierarchy. Uh, for now, we have no, no net loss com formal no net loss commitment at corporate level yet. Uh, but what we have is a biodiversity strategy and a biodiversity roadmap, which is currently under submission uh, for labeling by the uh, French Ministry of Environment uh, and Sustainable, Sustainable Development and Energy uh, in the scope of the French uh, national, um, the French national uh, strategy for biodiversity, and in this roadmap for biodiversity, uh, there are a whole uh, range of uh, action which are planned in order to improve our practices of mitigation hierarchy. And this roadmap sets the priority on av avoidance and reduction, but also have a range of uh, action in order to integrate biodiversity concern really upstream of the project uh, uh, decision making. Uh, and we are also uh, for what uh, uh, for uh, re regarding uh, compensation, we are also now um, uh, conducting um, an experimentation of uh, mitigation banking. Okay, so I'm hearing a lot about kind of integrating biodiversity into other goals and systems rather than being a standalone goal. Um, Helen, spend a, the, the four speakers so far have really come from concession-based industries. You're really about managing supply chains and first, second, third, and fourth tier suppliers. What have you been managed to, what, what, what goals have you managed to put in place? And tell the audience a little bit about how you built that case within caring to convince them this was an important thing to do amongst all the other things that they have to consider. Okay, thanks Ashton. And good morning everybody. Thank you very much for having the opportunity to um, be here and to discuss this really interesting topic with you all. Um, happy birthday Bebop. I'm very happy that I was involved with Bebop when it was a toddler at three years old in 2007. Um, and now I'm very happy to be back uh, and to really be hearing about how far it's progressed and so on. Let me give you a little introduction on Caring because you might not all know Caring, but you'll know our brands. Our brands are Gucci, Stella McCartney, Alexander McQueen, uh, Bottega Veneta, Puma, and so on. So we're a luxury sports and lifestyle company, French company, uh, and we have 22 brands. Now I'm in the sustainability department of Caring, and I work with all our brands to help them put in place the sustainability, their strategies, and, their, and the targets, which we've agreed on at a group level. So individual brands have their different approaches to meeting our group-wide targets. And I'm the conservation and ecosystem services specialist in Caring, so when people ask me, is Caring serious about biodiversity and conservation, I say, have you heard, seen my title? You know, like I really am there to try and see how, where the interface of our business is with biodiversity and ecosystems, how we can really mitigate um, our impact and create positive outcomes. Now, our, our commitment to biodiversity and sustainability, it's implicit and explicit through our strategy and through our group-wide targets. It comes from the very top of the company, the commitment to sustainability. I would like to say that I drove it, but I didn't. It's been driven from the very top, from Monsieur Pinot, the CEO, who is committed to creating caring and helping the brands become more sustainable businesses and creating caring as a more sustainable business because he believes that um, it, it creates opportunities, it drives innovation, and it reduces risks for the risk for the company. So how do we articulate our commitment to biodiversity and ecosystem services and conservation? We articulate it explicitly, as I said, through public targets. So we have targets that we have actually recently given a progress report on. So if you Google the caring progress report targets, we announced in early May where we are on our 
public targets, self-imposed targets. Um, I guess there are three that are particularly relevant, four that are particularly relevant. One is about um, doing our environment profit and loss account, which is a natural capital account, which actually measures our environmental footprint across our entire supply chain and across our group and our companies. That's part of what we're committed to doing that, so measuring our impact. And then we have explicit targets about um, different raw materials. And we have, and in those targets, there's wording like no negative impact on biodiversity, local communities, and ecosystems, creating positive outcomes, and so on. So we actually have explicit, whether it's we're talking about gold and diamonds, leather or paper, we're talking about sustainably managed pro, um, production systems, and we're talking about no negative impacts, and we're talking about creating positive outcomes for people in the environment. So that's sort of how we articulate our, our commitment uh, to biodiversity and, and, uh, and within our sustainability framework. I would also say that we have a very, we have a public commitment to offset our scope one and scope two uh, carbon emissions across the whole company, and that we do through Red Plus offsetting and Red Plus offsetting is another way that we, we talk about creating positive benefits and uh, conservation of biodiversity and helping local communities. <coughs> Thank you, Ashton. Sorry, it was a bit longer um, than 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and, Jap, and after, after we have here Jap, I'm going to go to the audience to so get ready with your comments and questions. Jap, so you heard from De Beers and Caring and others that is almost like a leadership stand that somebody in the organisation took, but you come from a cooperative, which is a membership organisation, so how do you stimulate interest in, in no net loss and biodiversity conservation amongst your members? Yeah, thank you, Ashton. Um, maybe good to know for the people who don't know uh, Friesland Campina. As Ashton uh, said, we are one of the largest dairy cooperatives uh, in the world. Uh, we have 19,000 member farmers who own the company, so they own the company, and uh, we have the obligation to make value of their milk, of their product. Uh, but farmers realize uh, very good that, they, uh, that biodiversity is for them a very important uh, issue. Um, but at the moment, they don't call it biodiversity because it's, it's more their natural uh, habit. Uh, they own their land and they know that they, uh, when they uh, maintain their land in a, in a proper way, uh, that the yield is good, the yield for the grass is good, and their costs uh, are low. So, it, it's quite normal for farmers to uh, maintain uh, their land, but uh, at the other side, we also realize that biodiversity um, uh, is important uh, for farmers, and there uh, we identified nine uh, elements, uh, nine factors, uh, that are uh, responsible for, uh, for the reduction of biodiversity. You can think about energy and climate, uh, water, uh, water pollution, uh, for instance, by, uh, by manure, and so on and so on. Um, so we are working on those nine elements and trying uh, uh, to have them in our sustainability policy because sustainability is a very important part of the Friesland Campina policy. And we are taking step by step our farmers uh, to, to the next level to reduce uh, uh, the elements that affect uh, biodiversity. Uh, so commitments uh, are um, on, on global side, so we have uh, global biodiversity and you can think about uh, cattle feed, uh, for instance. We have commitments uh, about cattle feed, uh, that we, we want that farmers use uh, cattle feed from a sustainable source. So we agreed with feed industry that from 2015, uh, all the soy is produced from uh, RTRS-based uh, 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 producers. So that's one, uh, one commitment. Uh, another commitment is that we um, have uh, agreements with farmers that they reduce uh, the, the minerals from the manure uh, step by step uh, to be more in balance uh, what uh, the crop can use and that they put on the land. So this is one uh, commitment. And at this moment, we are working uh, to find out what the business case for farmers is, to show them if they improve biodiversity, uh, that it will increase their yield and will decrease uh, their costs. So for farmers, that is very important to convince them that working on biodiversity is a good business case uh, for them and will help them to reduce uh, their costs. So some, some encouraging news, some kind of sobering um, comments. Tony, the audience now, we've got some veteran um, corporate 
champions in the office. I can see Dave Richards in the back from many years at Rio Tinto building the case of biodiversity. Um, some comments and questions for the, for, the, for the panel or for general discussion. How difficult is it to build this case? Does biodiversity get in the way of building the business case within organizations we are in or work with? Dave and then John. Thanks, Ashton. Um, at the risk of boring people, I won't rerun the whole Rio Tinto biodiversity thing, but perhaps talk a little bit about the precursor to Rio Tinto's biodiversity strategy, which really started in about 2002. It was launched in Bangkok at the World Conservation Congress in 2004, which is when we first publicly made the commitment to have a net positive impact on biodiversity. Stuart, who's in the audience, would be better placed to tell anybody about you know, the trials and tribulations of implementing that commitment. But I'd just like to say, you have to have a climate for innovation and leadership in the highest level of the company for these kind of initiatives to have a chance of succeeding. And like this goes back, in Rio Tinto, it goes back to about 1997 when there was a very high level uh, review of strategic risks which the company faced. And you can say it was informed by things like Rio Tinto's experience at the St. Lucia project in South Africa or issues surrounding um, whether Mount Nimba was be a mining project or not, or whether rangy uranium in the Kakadu Park in Australia was going to be a project. And it, well, these were flashpoints which highlighted, if you like, the mining industry's inability to deal adequately with biodiversity issues at the high level of confrontation. Um, and Bob Wilson, who was the chair of Rio Tinto at the time, sort of decided that there were four strategic risks which the company faced, main ones. One was sustainable development. We didn't have a story about sustainable development, and that led to the Mining, Minerals and Sustainable Development project, which ran from 2000 to 2002. But it also spun off some topic-based concerns. Biodiversity was one of them. We plainly didn't have the capacity to deal with biodiversity issues when they cropped up. We didn't have an understanding in the company of how biodiversity impinged upon other people's expectations of biodiversity impinged upon <coughs> the activities of the company. And we better do something about it. Water was another one. A strategy for water was developed in the same sort of time frame. And the third specific topic was human rights, and a primer was developed for um, staff and managers in the company and how to improve performance on human rights in, in the company. So that's, that's how the biodiversity strategy got developed. I won't go on any longer because other people have other things to say. But it's the following wind, the, the, the climate that we were encouraged to develop a leadership position to innovate, to get into areas of expertise we didn't have by talking to people who wanted to work with us on it. And as Ashton knows, we formed a number of strategic partnerships with leading conservation NGOs to help us to build that capacity to, throughout the, the company to understand biodiversity better and to respond to it better. So I'll leave it at that. And John, maybe you have a word. So I mean, what I'm hearing from Dave is that um, you know, if we want to engage corporate leaders in this, we have to articulate in their language, which is more about risk, access to resources, scarcity of resources, rather than no net loss. Is that your experience, John? <coughs> Extra. Yeah. Oh, okay, you can, I'll let you ask your own question then, John. <laughs> I don't want to put your... <laughs> I'm, I'm simply interested in if uh, any of the panel have attempted to put a financial uh, uh, value on the material risk of uh, managing biodiversity or ecosystem services. In 2004, some of you will remember FNC Asset Management published one of the first uh, documents called Is Biodiversity a Material Risk for Companies? And still 10 years on, we don't have some of these figures. We've recently tried to do it for mining and oil and gas, looking at scheduling delays because it's difficult really to pin it down. When you get biodiversity and ecosystem service management right, it's like a well-run theater. Nothing really goes wrong. So it's difficult to uh, pin down what are the actual material risks. One way we've tried is by looking at scheduling. You know, projects will spend perhaps, when they're ramping up, five, six million dollars per day, then they've got MPV erosion uh, of not getting the projects in place in time. So looking at these uh, scheduling issues has worked certainly for mining and oil and gas to put down, come, come up with a figure of uh, how much can be saved through getting biodiversity management right? Um, uh, these are different uh, industries on the panel, so I'd like to hear if there are any examples of uh, putting a figure on the value of biodiversity risk management. Well, I think that's a brilliant segue to the next topic where we want to talk about kind of tools and how do you measure and assess biodiversity. So um, perhaps I could ask Warwick to 
address in, in your experience in the beers, what tools are you using at the corporate level to do the things like uh, John Ekstrom is, is suggesting? Thanks, Ashton. Yeah, I mean, to, put a, to come up with an answer around cost, is, I think, is very difficult. I think, you know, it, probably most companies are going to look at that. And, and, and that's one of the, the key drivers is, is, is around coming up, with a, coming up with a value. I mean, if, it, if, it's, if it's a bottom line decision, if it's, if it's going to impact business and that, then that's obviously going to, going to flag it. And I think one of the things that we've seen is, is, is certainly around, and you mentioned it, some of the project delays, is around stakeholder opposition and around environmental issues. And so if you can get that right in the, in the early planning stages, you, that'll help to reduce the project cost, but you know, do you actually quantify it at the end of the day? You, know, you probably should, and, the, and you know, that's another point, is, is to actually document some of those steps throughout these, these project life cycles, where some of these key decisions have been taken, to actually record you know, those steps that were taken, the management interventions that were taken, and also to put a cost to it. So I think that's, that, you know, that's a useful sort of take home from that. I mean, in terms of tools, we've, we, as I said, we, we came up with a commitment, and then I guess the, the, the sort of question is to say, well, how, how are we and are we achieving no net loss? And it's been very difficult, and they, they, there are a number of tools out there, but I think you know, what, what we wanted to try and come up with was a, a tool or a, or a methodology that would fit um, our operations in Canada right through to operations in, in Namibia and, and even in the marine environment. And so I think, you know, it arguably could be quite simplistic, but I think we, we, we took it as a, as a broad approach to, to look at, to say, how can we assess biodiversity on each of our operations? And as I said before, it came, it came from a policy commitment, and it's written into our, our biodiversity standard. And then within the standard, there's a number of, of guidelines around assessing biodiversity. And so one of the tools that we've developed is a, a biodiversity value assessment that, that basically looks at the at the residual impact of each of our operations and, and try and ad admittedly now get a retrospective assessment around what the actual biodiversity uh, value is and then bring that into our biodiversity action plans and management plans going forward so that operations have a very clear understanding of what the risk, what the key biodiversity risk is to the business. And at the end of the day, you know, the, the reputational value around our product, which is diamonds, is obviously going to be key. So focusing on stakeholder uh, um, opposition and focusing on, on those key environmental risks of each operation is, is what's going to be driving those, those biodiversity action plans. So it's, a, it's an internal um, tool, if you can call it that, Ashton, that's, that's based on you know, sort of key uh, landscape level habitat and as well as species assessments that gives a very broad indication of what the, what the biodiversity risk is to those uh, individual operations. And, and Jim, you, you mentioned your last commitment uh, around biodiversity. H have you managed to develop KPIs around that, if that's what um, uh, uh, Farage in, does as a management practice? Okay, I mean, in terms of KPIs, uh, the, the KPIs that we have um, already in place are um, how we're progressing in putting uh, biodiversity management plans in place at uh, all of our, uh, op our quarry and cement operations. So. We identified uh, about 20% of our quarries that were within uh, 500 meters of internationally recognized sensitive areas, and, and by that I mean you know, IUCN1 right the way through to non-classified. Non so we've been very broad uh, in terms of, of what we classify as international areas. It includes Ramsar, uh, IBA, uh, it includes Natura 2000 and so on. So we've completed biodiversity management plans for each of those locations. Uh, we are close, we're over 85% of our quarries have rehabilitation plans in place. Um, and uh, we have done, as I say, a screening exercise for all of our quarries uh, around the world, all of our sites. Um, where we are now is that we are um, now looking at a methodology uh, that will uh, enable us to start to demonstrate which of our operations are likely to achieve a net positive impact. And, and, and that stage, we're, we're still working the, the, mechan you know, the mechanism of that. So we, are, we're not, not, we have only just released that, uh, public, that publicly that commitment. So we're not at a, at, a, at a stage yet that we can start reporting on that. But we would expect to be reporting at the end of next year uh, you know, on, on, on the progress being made for that. So we're still, we're still kind of relying on uh, things like um, designated sites and special areas which have been generated by governments or the conservation community. And we're still a little bit away from um, indicators which can measure net positive impact. Is, is that your experience as well, Sophie? 
Um, the question about the measurement is a, a key question. It's not an easy one, frankly speaking. So we have much more in the process of having implementing uh, internal tools to be able to apply the mitigation hierarchy to have the evidence and the quotation and assessment on how it is applied, how to, to assess the environmental impact assessment of a project right from the beginning with or without applied this uh, avoidance approach and how step after step on a tiered approach you're able at the end to finalize with a project with a minimum impact assessment and then consider the, the non-net loss approach when, when, when uh, mandatory. So we are much more in a, a way of having a tool to be able to assess sensitivity, criticity of all those uh, aspects, including social, biodiversity, and environmental uh, bodies, but the giving a, a, a value uh, on, on it, it's something that is very, very difficult. We are able to consider it in terms of all what will be requested in terms of contability and capital expenditure investment or operational expenditure cost, but we don't consider it as a part of the day-to-day -day business. So it's, it's something that we are working on. It's not finalized. Mm -hmm. I know you want to come in. Um, I, I want to bring in um, Evelyn uh, Trinez, um, I think is in the audience, who's, if you were advising these guys on measurement, I know you have a, a you're developing a method, an, an approach to do this. Do you want to say a little bit about that and how you would help these guys uh, measure their net positive Im impact or how that would work, potentially? <laughs> yeah, thanks, uh, Ashton. Um, we, we recognize the challenge that, that the large corporations face in, uh, in measuring and monitoring biodiversity and, and environmental impacts. Uh, so with a couple of colleagues of mine, including Stephen De Beer next to me, we developed a, a tool. Basically, it's a, it's a certification tool that looks at environmental impacts of large corporations or any, any kind of corporation and tries to compensate residual uh, footprint of the company. So, so what we do for a start is uh, we put a, a, a time frame around assessing the impact. So we look at the impacts of a, a defined period of time in the past. So, and we're looking at environmental aspects rather than trying to measure and monitor uh, biodiversity. Biodiversity is a if you, you measure that, it's a cumulative effect of uh, basically anything from climate change and impacts of the company, but also <coughs> normal evolutionary process. So that's difficult. So we disaggregate the environmental impacts, uh, looking at different environmental aspects, quantify those over time. The companies, they do go through mitigation hierarchy, but the residual footprint is then compensated in uh, local projects and initiatives that, uh, that bring benefits to the local communities and the, and the local governments and, and nature conservation <coughs> organizations, whilst at the same time compensating residual footprints of the companies over a specific period of time. Thank you. So there are tools being developed out there. Are there any other kind of comments or questions? And I'll ask um, Marie-Yves to wrap up this particular topic before we move on to the next one. Yes, sir. Thanks, Louise. Yeah, Ashton, it's frustrating that there is no quantitative answer to this question of costing risk. In the UK, we're trying to sell offsetting and the mitigation hierarchy as the solution to a problem, but it's very difficult to quantify the problem. Business resorts to anecdotes about how the environment gets in the way, and everyone has an anecdote about a development that was held up for two years whilst a furry animal was moved, but it's always anecdote, and, and we struggle to sell the solution to government because <coughs> business doesn't come forward with an accurate cost to the risk. And why, why do you think that is? Because I, I push back and say there are, I say there are right. tools out there and there are ways to measure things, so why, what is stopping people well, from I'm, agreeing I'm, on what's So I'm measure? struggling because the, the tools we're referring to here are tools about environmental impact. Right. and measuring environmental loss and gain, and that's one issue. The but mitigation I, type I'm, thing. I'd like to go back to the original question, mm -hmm. which is, are there tools for costing the business risk? And that's where I'm finding the frustration. Okay. 
frustrated gentleman to enlighten lady in the front. <laughs> I think I missed somebody up there. Um, I can go. So just to say, so I'm from Stella McCartney and we're part of Caring. And just to say that we are costing our environmental impact with the environmental profit and loss that Caring has helped us to develop, um, that they've developed for all the brands in the group. And we are working across our entire supply chain to look at a variety of impacts and giving them a financial value. I mean, I'm sure Helen can probably go into more detail on this about how it specifically relates back to biodiversity, but there are tools being developed by big corporations to look specifically at that. And I think that more companies need to consider putting real numbers on their environmental impacts, but it is starting to happen. It's more just about making people actually do it. Ashton, forgive me, sorry. It's not the cost of the cut, it's not the cost of the impact. Right. It's, it's the cost, cost of the risk. environment stopping the company doing it. It's not how much damage is being done and costing that. This is a question of how much does it cost the company to deal with the environment. Right. I, I, I got you. I got you. Let's give other people a chance. There's somebody at the third row from the back, I think. Yes, sir. Hi, yeah. So, um, in terms of the application and the mitigation hierarchy to operational sites, obviously one of the mechanisms for achieving no net loss or MPI is to avoid impacts, and some impacts are non-offsettable. So I just was interested to hear from anyone on the panel who have operational sites where there are material, where there is material that they'd like to access, but there's been a recognition that there, there has to be some level of avoidance and foregoing of accessing material either for legal reasons or because there's biodiversity that simply cannot be replaced on site. Okay, was, there, was there one more? And I'll take one and I'll turn to Marie. Okay, but the last word to you and then I'll ask. Very eager to respond, and then we'll go to Helen, and you can wrap us up with the. Thank you. So just to lift it up uh, a level, so Glenn Davis, uh, WWF UK, um, there are currently efforts to press for environmental reporting to be mandatory as part of annual reports, and does this encourage the uh, environment for CEOs to look more positively on investing further in indicators and so forth? picking up on Dave's point, but is mandatory reporting a good and important tool pressure to encourage this behavior? Thanks. So, Marie, do you want to respond to that? And we'll give Sophie a quick chance, and then we'll go on to the beyond extractors and supply chain. Marie. Yeah, perhaps uh, um, some words on, on the topics before about costs of what it costs to the company if a uh, project has stopped. Uh, we try to make these exercises, but we are missing tools to do it in a meaningful way. But in fact, today, the, the problem of cost is not the cost of measure to compensate. It is really the cost if uh, there is big delays in some building works. But it's still very, we're missing here uh, the uh, tools. Um, then for the, for the, um, the point on uh, could some project be stopped because there was not enough done uh, during the mitigation reality. So we had never, on my knowledge, so really stopping, but we had delays in getting some op uh, authorization where we had to make new proposal uh, uh, and we didn't get the authorization the first time uh, by the, uh, the environmental authority. So, uh, yes, it so happens. So there is a cost, but it's not always quantified the way that other things are quantified within a business. It's almost you discover it afterwards, what the cost was, rather than anticipating it. Yeah. Sophie, do you want to? Um, yes, to the first question raised uh, uh, regarding the uh, reality of the application of the avoidance and mitigation hierarchy. Yes, I can tell you there is concrete example where we have said regarding new project or due diligence in, in terms of uh, potential of new, uh, new acquisition or, or, or new uh, mining areas that where we have said, okay, sorry guys, but based on the risk management, uh, risk assessment, based on the social part, based on the biodiversity part, we will never go there. We will never give you a go. It's always will be a no-go and there, there is no way to escape. So it has been done and it has been, we have real concrete um, reference where we have decided not to go 
to a part of a mining concession because in that part you have the last uh, part portion of the primar primary hold forest. I don't know what it could be the exact example, but it's clearly the case. And in, in the, Indone Indonesian, the Indonesian project we talked about yesterday with, with Gavin in the subsession, he clearly mentioned three examples where we have decided not to go for a quarry. Uh, limestone quarry uh, because it was uh, from the social and biodiversity side very sensitive and non unacceptable so at corporate level and with the team we decided not to go there and we have other examples. What is sure that it's the, the application and mit of the mitigation hierarchy internally in the way teams are working together change a lot the organization of the business. It's a real um, capacity building, and we don't have now uh, operational team or uh, engineering team working alone designing the project without having all the information of the, the, the place where they will have to play the game. And before knowing the place where, where we have to play the game, there is a long-term or medium-term period where we have to acquire a lot of information on social biodiversity and environmental body. And there, the work we are conducting with external independent body is very, very important because it's so, uh, it's required a, a so highly skilled uh, competency that we cannot conduct it al alone. So we need to build so, such kind of network and, and partnership, but it's part of the reality of our job today, clearly, yes. If you're yeah, very quick, then I want to move on to... Just a lighting. very quick uh, answer. I mean, there are a lot of tools out there. IBAT's a classic example. There are many other tools that you can actually, before you even start getting too far down in a project, you can look at an assessment of the area. You can see what, whether there are, you know, high biodiversity areas and so on. So, you know, I think there are many tools out there that people can use even at the sort of desktop level before they even start to go too far with a project to see whether it's, it's near or in a sensitive area. But sometimes you find that there can actually be positive outcomes. I mean, I'll give a, a couple of examples that we've had in, in UK and France where there has been a typical triple S eyesight. Uh, it's been a relatively small piece of, let's say, for example, acid grassland. Um, and what we've actually done working with the, the local nature trust, working with the local authorities have, have said, right, if we can possibly relocate that, that, that area, and this has been done with the experts in terms of the process of doing that to make sure that it's all done correctly. We'll uh, ensure that when we actually restore the area, not only will there be that small uh, piece of uh, acid grass or whatever, the, our whole restoration project will be that will actually increase the area to make it a more of a viable area for that type of habitat. So sometimes, you know, you can have a protected area which can be managed you know, properly uh, through working with NGOs, through working with authorities, and you can create a positive outcome because w what was a small isolated area can become a very large area, which is far more sustainable. So that you know, the, 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 there is, there are, the, there are, you know, possibilities to to work in in, in some protected areas, but it's got to be done and managed properly. Okay, so, so let's move now on to um, those businesses which have to manage a supply chain. So they might not manage or own concessions or sites but that's where they source from, but it could be three or four tiers down their supply chain. So I'm gonna ask um, Helen to speak about caring, and then uh, Dev, who's written a report on Beyond Extractives, um, to talk about that, and then Jack to talk from the perspective of a food producer and marketer. Great, thanks Ashton. Really good um, points and questions being raised, and I would like to get back to this question of valuing and costing, valuing biodiversity and costing risk. Um, and as, as uh, Claire mentioned, the environment profit and loss helps you along that thinking of how you can value um, and cost your value your impact on the environment. But then how you how you cost that and how you relate an environmental profit and loss, an environmental footprint to your profit and loss account as a company, is a is a different. Is a different bit of thinking, and there's still a lot of, of, of work we need to do to say, well, given that we make this choice in terms of in reducing our environmental footprint, what impact does that have on our profit and loss account? Now, in my business, it's, it's in a certain biodiversity, it's relatively easy to articulate that because we're probably one of the few companies here that actually source biodiversity for our products. 
Stella notwithstanding, uh, so that we, we, the value of the biodiversity and, and, and making sure that we, we, uh, we extract and use that biodiversity in a very sustainable, <coughs> robust, functional way is very clear in our business. It's a, little, it's a little harder to articulate the value of doing something in a biodiversity conservation friendly way or a no net loss way when it's not directly biodiversity that we're sourcing, when it's a fibre or a... Or, um, or something like that. So, and then saying, well, if we take the more sustainable approach, the more, it, what's the cost back and what's the value to the EPNL and what's the value in the profit and loss in terms of reducing risk because we've gone to a more sustainable production system. So there's a lot of good thinking and um, work to do in there that we, we haven't got all the answers on that. But what I did want to just touch on a bit more is the environment profit and loss account. Now whether you call it an EPNL, whether you call it just a corporate natural capital account, I think this is a really fabulous tool for us all to reflect on and use where we can um, to really understand our sort of overall footprint. Now I'm, let me just step back a bit and say two things about context and scope. Okay, so I'm, I work for a fashion company. So the, the, the scope that I'm, I'm looking at here is, is, is much more, my supply chains are diffuse and global. And the impact is therefore diffuse and global. That's very different to the extractives and infrastructure project-based um, scopes that we've been talking about, which are much more discrete, identifiable, defined, right? So, so just want you to just think about the fact that I'm coming from a different scope and that my context is a little different. I was thinking yesterday when we were looking at the, um, those fabulous presentations from Mongolia and Uzbekistan with the protected areas and everyone was talking about, you know, how you, how you, how you fund the protected areas and offsets and so on. And, and to me it was like looking at one of those Rorschach ink blot, you know those, yes I had to look it up on Google too, you know those things that you can have either it's a, a butterfly or it's a devil, you know where when you look at it, so when I'm looking at those maps I'm saying well I, I believe in protected areas and I know it's a great way of saving biodiversity but what I'm interested in is all that in between bit where they're growing cashmere or cotton or whatever because what do we do in those bits to protect by or to maximise biodiversity value and ecosystem service value. So I'm sort of seeing it in the contrary. So my context is a little different and my scope is a little different. That being said, the environment profit and loss, which I'm not going to go into huge detail about, but was launched originally in 2010 by Puma, uh, one of our companies, and it has since been refined a great deal and we've just done it now across 73% of our business. It will be publicly announced at a group-wide level in 2016. It is a natural cap, corporate natural capital account that looks at our footprint across our entire supply chain and measures six main indicators, greenhouse, greenhouse gas waste, water and air pollution, water use and land use conversion. Therein lies the key on how, what our impacts are on land and ecosystems. It measures that and then it puts an economic value or a financial value to that. So when, what you get at the end as a company is across your entire supply chain, this is what your impact looks like and here are the hot spots. Here are the places where it's really expensive to do business the way you're doing business. And why is it expensive there? It might be because the production system is using water in an area where water is scarce think cotton in Central Asia or something like that. Or it might be that the production system that we're sourcing from is particularly um, detrimental to, is causing land use conversion or whatever. So it highlights in your supply chain where there are these sort of expensive ways you're doing business in environmental terms. Then you can hone in on those and say, okay, wow, my cotton sourcing needs some improvement in terms of environmental impact. So then you start figuring out, okay, so what do I do about that? And that's where you build partnerships and you look at ways of, of, of putting in place. Then I go back to more of a project level solution. So but, Helen, just ask so, a question. So if I were the head of an interested conservation group, I gave that's fantastic lot of information that you've managed to garner from your supply chain. Um, how are you doing in terms of biodiversity? 
And I would go back to the conservation and the organisation and say... Don't answer this question. No, no, no. I would say, no, it will help us out because I want to, we want to reduce... We want to make our environmental footprint less. We want to create positive outcomes. So I need them to help me. How do I grow wool in Patagonia, which TNC is doing a great job with Ovis ranches, in a way that generates biodiversity value and ecosystem service value? Help me out. And Stella McCartney has sourced some of that wool already. So help us find those ways that we can create those positive benefits. So, so, by, so by having oversight of your supply chain, a role that Karen can play is to generate this information, which could then be put to use. But that's only part of the story. The other part of the story is that you've got to bring other people around Absolutely you. Absolutely. Yeah. And practice. certifications and verifications. Like, what is biodiversity friendly? Wildlife friendly. How do we define that? So, Is it related to this? Yeah. yeah. OK. So my question then is to flip that on its head a little bit. But do you sell more handbags or shoes or, in Yap's case, milk? Like, is it, is it, you know, what is, is at the end of the day, as a, sorry, at the end of the day as a business, you know, from the business case perspective, are you, you know, you've done the right thing for biodiversity? Does it help your bottom line? Do you want to answer that first? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, Jack, why don't you? See how not 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 Karen's bottom line, but your bottom line, yes. No, I'll, I'll, go, I'll answer it. No, for, for us it's clear, we, we don't sell more milk. Uh, but we believe that, that uh, if you want uh, to continue your business, and farmers want to continue their business, that they have to work on biodiversity and that they have to work on sustainability. Otherwise, it will stop after uh, maybe 10 years, maybe 20 years, but we believe that sustainability must be a part of our business. And no, we, we, we can't increase the price of milk. And uh, no, we don't sell more milk, but we believe that it is necessary for a long-term term business. And that's the business case, and therefore always for farmers. We are looking for a business case for farmers. We believe very much that, uh, for instance, the, the quality of soil is very important for them, but it's also very important for biodiversity. So we are always trying to find out what is the business case for farmers to improve biodiversity and to improve their business, to re reduce costs and so on. And that's, that costs a, a, a lot of time because biodiversity is not an item that is familiar to farmers at this moment. Yeah, they, they, they are maintaining the landscape, so they are familiar with that. But the, the, the word biodiversity is for them, for farmers in, in, in Europe, is quite, yeah, not, it's quite a strange word. They don't know what it is. And, and, and so therefore, we're trying to support them to increase biodiversity, but also to increase, uh, to reduce their cost and to increase their profits. But I, th I think you were saying last night that you know, your, your performance is measured on the price you're able to maintain for your members. And to maintain that price, um, you've got to ensure that the quality and all the other attributes to do with your milk and associated with your milk yep. is reflecting that price. So you could say, in fact, this is one very important attribute yep. in getting that, that, that price. Yep. Can I just answer that too? Yes, we will sell more handbags, or in my case, more shoes. Yeah, it's, it, it, have, I, have we measured that yet? No, we've been on this journey for a couple of, of years. And why am I so clear about that? Because we care about, we need as a business, we need access to resources, we need access to high quality resources, sometimes scarce resources, sometimes precious resources. And we need them in a, in a way that, that fulfills our commitment to our consumers and to our shareholders. And we have a very public commitment to that. So. Yes, between the business case of having access to high quality resources and stability of those resources, we're in a crazy volatile world and prices are going up and down, up and down, up and down. So if you can develop relationships with producers and develop a more stable, predictable um, pricing structure in your supply chain, that is a great, that's worth a lot of um, business value. So I think there's a lot of business value. Under, we are a business. We're doing this for a commitment, but we're also doing it because it has business value. Um, and yes, we will sell more hamburgers. Dev, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about your report and the findings on the report on Beyond Extractive, I think it's called. Yep. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ashton, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Okay being heard? It sounds wonderful. Okay, great. <laughs> um, just to tell you a little bit it's, um, about something that IUCN's um, business and biodiversity program initiated, uh, I should mention that this is kind of in synergy or in parallel with um, 
an initiative called the NPI Alliance, or the Net Positive Impact Alliance, that um, our program um, is a coordinator, and this is um, an alliance of five organizations, Rio Tinto, Shell, the Nature Conservancy, and IFC, uh, essentially establishing a community of best practice um, for implementing NPI approaches with um, a major focus on the extractive sector. Uh, but stemming from that work, um, IUCN has started to do some thinking in terms of what could no net loss approaches uh, mean um, when you start to go beyond the extractive sector. And essentially this is the mandate of um, our business, business and biodiversity program. So we recently convened a working group to explore the feasibility of, let's just call it NPI approaches in sectors beyond extractives. And I want to stress this is a work in progress and it's a fairly exploratory uh, working group. Uh, the working group itself is composed um, of a few companies involved in the commercial, agriculture, and forestry sectors. Uh, so it's co-financed by UPM forest, a forestry company, Shell Biofuels, as well as Nestle and Espresso and Novozymes that are participating. And conservation experts from some IUCN NGO members, including from Conservation International, TNC, WWF, and partners as well, all with experience in implementing NPI approaches. The working group chose to focus on commercial agriculture and forestry sectors as they have large impacts, of course, on biodiversity, cumulatively even more so than the extractive sectors. The working group uh, has identified some key differences of these two sectors compared to the extractive sectors. Uh, and just to give you some examples of, of these differences, starting with a greater spatial scale of impact, agriculture and forestry are impacting often larger proportions um, of a given landscape more distributed sources of impacts in terms of um, having a diverse range of land holdings from small scale uh, to large industrial scales, which means the impacts are distributed amongst the contributors. The temporal scale of impact uh, is typically permanent, so once the land is used, it's likely to be retained uh, for a productive uh, capacity. There are more avoidance and minimization options, so for example, avoidance of natural habitat conversion or avoidance of high conservation value areas uh, Generally, areas suitable for agriculture and forestry are vast compared with extractive industries where the resource, of course, is highly localized. A key issue that's come up is, is setting the baseline. So the baseline for the state of biodiversity prior to the agriculture or forestry activity is not always clear because many projects will likely be in existing managed landscapes. And some agriculture and forestry systems may be the baseline situation itself rather than a pristine natural system. I'll just wrap up with some initial findings from the, from the paper. Um, and this paper is expected to be completed by the end of this summer. Um, a known at loss approach in agriculture and forestry sectors could be feasible under certain conditions. For example, biodiversity compatible practices, sustainable intensification, particularly in existing land uses. The mitigation hierarchy for managing biodiversity risk is an applicable guidance framework credible sustainability standards and certification schemes in the agriculture and forestry sectors can be a useful starting point, especially for avoidance and, and minimization steps. But these systems still do not explicitly uh, include a no net loss or a net positive impact goal within, within them in terms of their standard content. I'll just end um, with, uh, with a quote from a recent paper in the Oryx by uh, Rainey et al. titled, A Review of Corporate Goals of No Net Loss and Net Positive Impact on Biodiversity, where strikingly there is no agriculture or forestry company that is publicly committed to a, an explicit no net loss approach. Agriculture and logging, for example, both present much greater threats to both threatened and non-threatened species than, extractive, than the extractive industry. Data from the IUCN Red List show that agriculture and logging threaten 11,505 and 10,419 species, respectively, including 5,000 threatened species each, whereas extractive industry th threatens 2,698 species, of which 1,293 are already categorized as threatened. Agriculture and logging, therefore, threaten more than three times as many species as mining. Thanks. So before we move on to the, the final topic, are there any um, points on how the supply chain can be a, a lever for achieving no net loss or what they, should, what they should do? Any examples? 
So I think just uh, in the last kind of five minutes, which I think we have um, available, you know, we, we have a panel mostly of um, business representatives, and I was in the NGO world for 13 years, and we had great fun telling business what they should do. But now I kind of want to flip it on its head a little bit and ask the business folk here on the stage, what is it that they need from uh, policymakers and partnerships and civil society um, to enable them to uh, achieve this goal for, of, 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 of no net loss? Um, and perhaps actually I'll ask um, Dev to kind of set the scene and what, what, what we, through, through the, for the NP Alliance, what, what's your challenge to the companies and what are you willing to give in return to help them achieve it? <laughs> I would speak uh, directly in the context of NPI Alliance. I'll speak more broadly in terms of um, IUCN's mandate in terms of the business and biodiversity program. Typically, I'd say we, uh, our collaborations with business include a challenge function, but it's a challenge function that works both ways. So we try to, to push businesses to, to, uh, to think more in terms of how they can contribute to the conservation agenda. But likewise, uh, as has come up in the discussion, earlier already is businesses push us back to say what is the business case uh, so it was really interesting to hear about the the discussion in terms of the environmental profit and loss and and costing risk and, and access to capital so that's um, also makes our recommendations a bit more practical and pragmatic the other area that we offer is uh, to bring scientific expertise uh, and objective expertise to business. IUCN has over 11,000 voluntary experts in our technical <coughs> commissions, uh, and so we will often um, have scientific panels uh, when businesses are interested in under understanding what is the science um, of an issue and what is the evidence of an issue. And lastly, I'd say we do provide, uh, I think it was mentioned earlier, tools such as IBAT, the Integrated Biodiversity Assessment Tool, uh, which is an integrator of various IUCN knowledge products, including protected areas, red list uh, of species, red list of ecosystems once it's developed, and key biodiversity areas. But these are tools uh, that we also have the expertise to guide business in terms of how they could apply it. And then lastly, I think what we also get out of it is, is the real-world application of conservation science. Thanks. How about your endorsement? Endorsement in terms of? <laughs> when companies do good, good things, do you? Do you support them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the, uh, the NPI Alliance is an example uh, of a, fa a, fa a fairly big endorsement in terms of working with companies that um, are interested in committing to, um, to implementing net positive impact approaches on the ground. And then you started to talk about um, partnerships on the ground to enable you to act on yeah. the information. Uh, so th I think the question, though, was uh, what, do we, what do I need from... This yeah. group, yeah. So or, the partnership. Policymakers, oh, policy makers, more NGOs. Generally. Well, as I mean, yeah, definitely the partnerships with NGOs and with IUCN, particularly we work with the species specialist groups, um, and with we have partnerships with WCS, Wildlife Friendly Enterprise Network, TNC, National Wildlife mm. Federation. That is absolutely essential to, for us to define what does a biodiversity friendly, no net loss, net gain, whatever you want to call it, approach in a production system and there around look like. And so that my, my, that's really important for us is to be able to define what does that production system look like for our raw, particularly our, for our sourcing and raw materials and what can we do to improve it, to make, make it more um, uh, and how do we measure that? And how do we know that we're on the right track? So I think that is absolutely essential, the thinking in that, and also the sort of certification, verification, the, the, the discipline that goes into being able to say, this is a production system that, that helps biodiversity, that creates um, positive outcomes for di biodiversity in local communities is essential. I would say a, a request to you all, um, because I haven't, been, I haven't been involved in this for uh, several years, and I see, see there's an incredible amount of knowledge and thinking and expertise around measuring biodiversity and ecosystem services at a site-based level particularly. 
Um, and that is really important. That thinking is really important to go into the natural capital accounting thinking as that is and um, evolutional development that's happening over the now, currently, but over the next couple of years in particular as we think about what are the standard methodologies for companies to do natural capital accounting, what are the principles, what are the measurements. It would be great to have more of your thinking and expertise in those, and I see we're a little siloed at the moment, so my request would be let's try and, and build some more bridges um, between these different great uh, um, topics. Thank Perhaps you. That one to come in then. Yeah, maybe, maybe uh, some words about cooperation uh, in the Netherlands. In, uh, two years ago, uh, uh, ICN, uh, together with the Employees Association, uh, uh, started, founded a platform by, for biodiversity, and NGOs are in it, governments are in it, and businesses uh, are in it. And I think that's, that's a good approach, to, to work together, to know what, what elements are, uh, to know how we can work together. We work with WWF, we work with Solidaridad, a large NGO who helps us uh, to improve, for instance, uh, the fruit for our products, to, to, to find out standards for, for fruit and so on. So uh, working together with NGOs is very valuable uh, for us. And, and yeah, it, it, uh, for, for NGOs, it's also very important to find out w what businesses uh, are. And, and yeah, the word business case, yeah, it, it is quite an important word for us. We, we need to convince our, our business partners, we need to convince our suppliers, we need to convince our member farmers uh, to work on biodiversity. And finding a business case together is always better than do it alone. Mm -hmm. How about for, for the mining companies? Is it really possible to make no-go commitments to certain areas without having a policy framework behind that? Um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, it's as always there is the pros and cons. Um, you know we have we to deal with a multitude of constraints uh, all around the world uh, regarding social, political, uh, environmental, societal, and, and biodiversity issues. So there is. N from my perspective, no policy of no, no no possibility of having only one kind of policy set for worldwide. So we need to have uh, um, public policies in regard to uh, methodology guidelines and and recognized tools. It's very very important to to agree a, a, a around the methodology. But uh, after that, the way the, the 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 real need will be defined, designed, and implemented is to be uh, taken on a cautious uh, approach on a case by case uh, level. And uh, and uh, yes, uh, all these uh, values around the the, the, the biodiversity. Uh, uh, real uh, sensitivity and, and ecosystem services criticity has to be uh, very, very seriously and critically assessed. But what will be the end and the final uh, ideal uh, uh, solution to be implemented is something that is, is to be uh, uh, considered as a tiered approach. So yes, there is a need of, of public policy, but with a reasonable approach. And in regard to the um, input of the civil society, yes, there is no more discussion on that. It's very, very important. But step after step and uh, proportionate to the timeline of uh, a life of a project, right from the beginning, there is a lot to do to know what we are talking about. And, and all the, as I just said at the beginning of, of the uh, discussion, there are so many important, highly skilled uh, needs in terms of project management that uh, we need to really work in an open mining approach with all parties uh, really engaged to collaborate and uh, with relation based on trust. If not, we will never be able to, to reach the real uh, positive goal. Jim and then Eva. Um, well, just to say, we, we, we have made a commitment in terms of not opening new quarries in specific protected areas. So if you look at uh, our website, you'll be able to get more details on that. Uh, back in 2012, we, we issued our 2020 uh, sustainability ambitions, and these relate to social, environment, economics. So we have uh, targets to, to create uh, employment. We have targets related to access to, to low-cost housing. We have targets to try and... In, improve the, uh, the actual footprint of, of uh, infrastructure and new infrastructure that's developed, new uh, solutions uh, to look at both green 
green areas, green corridors, and ways of trying to improve the quality of life uh, in, in, in cities, new cities that are being developed or, or refurbishment of existing cities. But one key area uh, with any project is partnerships. Uh, and if I give an example just on the water side, uh, rather than just us committing to reduce our water by 10%, and we could do that in an area which has got abundant water, and it would be absolutely meaningless. What we've done is a bit like we have on biodiversity. We've screened all of our operations to see which operations are in extreme scarcity areas and, and scarcity areas for water. And then we've got commitments that in areas where we have actually got operations, we will work together with industry and communities in those areas to try and drive down consumption to ensure that the water is preserved, not only for the industry that's working there, but for the communities as well. And it's that type of partnership, it's working with experts, NGOs that have the, the skills that, that are, are necessary, working with the communities, uh, raising awareness to make them realize that they can do things a different way, talking to farmers to say, look, you can actually you know, work and use water in a more efficient way and so on. It's only by having a partnership approach that you'll actually try and start to solve these goals. And with biodiversity, with water, if you haven't got local solutions, you'll never solve the problem. It's local solutions that are all joined up that solve a global problem. Marie? Um, I would like to address more the policy, uh, the need, um, because uh, we need more from policy as just setting uh, objectives. We need the institutional arrangements, mm -hmm. uh, because we are not legitimate to do this. Um, this means setting the framework more precisely for uh, liabilities, duration for compensation, uh, financial terms, uh, contractual regimes and so on, and also setting uh, the condition, developing uh, science-based uh, methodology, uh, database and so on. But the more important is especially for energy, the energy sector where investments are done on a very long, uh, um, long uh, scale. Uh, temporary scale, we need a, there is a need of a stable legal framework where who would permit to uh, make project planning and um, by integrating meaningful uh, measures for biodiversity. Um, this is for us uh, more important. After when coming to stakeholders partnerships, there is a very interesting trend for the moment in the energy sector. It's not anymore about taking partner and stakeholder with us in compensation project or so on, but looking at compensation project or any other measure for biodiversity as a mean to be an actors of ter uh, territorial development. Mm -hmm. So it's rather to the other side, uh, looking how we could participate more to social economic development through these pro this pro biodiversity projects. And uh, I think this is a very different uh, model. Okay, so let's hear some more from the um, audience now um, about policy and international frameworks. Um, you know, the IFC Performance Standard 6 is invoked a lot in this conversation. Is that, I know some people get exercised about um, that. Uh. Yes, um, you all are leaders in the no net loss side of the equation, and many of your brethren may or may not be. And some of you are even adopting no net loss standards, which is really uh, great to hear. And the question I would have is, and going to, to Marie's point, would you all prefer regulatory support within the countries that you work to be able to set frameworks for you or not? Would that be helpful to have the government play a bigger role in, in ba basically leveling the playing field so that all your competitors are playing by the same rules? Have we got a, a similar question along those lines? And we'll collect two or three and then put it to the, put it to the panel. No, it looks like that is a definitive question. Who like Jim? Will I, yeah. have a uh, I mean, one thing that would really help us, you know, we've got over 2,000 uh, installations around the world. Uh, and if I want to do a net positive, if I want to do an ass a financial assessment, I don't want to do it once. I don't want to do it 10 times. It will cost me a fortune to do it once. So. Having a protocol like you have a CO2 protocol that's accepted around the world, having a global protocol to say this is how you actually account, this is the, the defined uh, methodology because at the moment there are so many assumptions out there that you know, depending on who 
is making those assumptions, you come up with different values. So if we really want to have a true value, let's have a protocol that is worldwide, that's accepted, that everybody can use, and a methodology. So that, that's one thing I would really appeal. And I think generally speaking around the world, you know, quite often, uh, let's call it the, the, the stick and carrot approach, is the way you actually get uh, things done. So you actually have legislation in place that makes sure that everybody follows the, the correct uh, route. But there is a carrot for those that really do get on and really do drive down that way. And, and I think having a stick carrot, carrot approach, having, a, uh, having uh, you know, legislation in place really helps because it gives surety to industry uh, and to other you know, sectors so they know what's ahead, what they have to achieve, and it helps them to, to plan and, and, and to move forward. So is your point that there's not a, a lack of accounting protocols, that there, there are competing mm -hmm. ones, is that? It's, and, and, yeah, and I think that there's a lack in some areas, but there's also competing in initiatives other in others, yeah. Got it. Yeah, I mean, just to add, I think, n not a, a sort of a cautionary approach, but I think there's also a, a level of maybe misunderstanding between what, what a government policy might, might want aim to achieve and what a company wants out of it. So I think... The, you know, and, the, and the point goes to the earlier discussion around partnerships. I think you know the, the, the business opportunity around working with NGOs, working with government uh, towards a let's say a, a policy or towards a common understanding is obviously key. So, you know, I, I would say yes from a legislative point of view, you probably have it as a as an opportunity, but there will certainly be a, a level of risk if the if the understanding as and, and as to the reason of why you know we're doing it are not fully understood. Have any of you been asked a question about your impacts and dependencies on natural capital by investors? And if not, how might you develop a dialogue with them? Who has investors? <laughs> Jim, um, again, Sophie. Hiya. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I think um, in terms of invest, I mean, we, uh, we, we have been producing sustainability reports, corporate reports for, for uh, a decade or more uh, on sustainability. Uh, the, the change in French law, there was a requirement to include that in the annual report as well, so that's been done for the last couple of years. We uh, have many third-party indices that, that assess uh, our operations, and we uh, complete many questionnaires to, to try and, and, and uh, to demonstrate uh, our activities and, and where we, we are going forward. I think on the natural capital side, you know, um, as I say, at the moment, we haven't gone down the route of trying to, uh, you know, as Puma have done and so on, to, to actually try and determine the, the, the precise uh, impacts or, or put a value to it just because of the concern of having so many operations and wanting to do it correctly and doing it once, you know, initially. So we've got a methodology in place. So we haven't had inquiries from investors as such on that. Uh, that they, uh, our, our investors tend to, to look uh, at um, the feedback they get from third parties or look at, sorry, look at our uh, sustainability reports, come to us with specific questions, but uh, I haven't had any specific questions on natural capital. You, you, don't, you, get any, you don't get any project or corporate finance from Equator um, Bank, um, for example, which invoke the IFC performance standards? Certainly, I mean, if there are specific projects that we have, um, you know, we have uh, requirements from the, the banks and so on, then obviously we will be complying with all those specific requirements. But I was just talking generally in terms of investors. Uh, yes, Jim said quite uh, everything on the topic, but yes, uh, I agree with him. We, we, we have a regular requirement and, and uh, auditing, audit uh, situation as well when we have to... to to require, ask for financial uh, investment, all these uh, performance standards and, and very highly reference standards are the first step of what is uh, going through when you receive an, a financial audit. It's not the, 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 the long-term cap, cap, capital revenue and so on that will be uh, looked first now. It's a social and environmental aspect. And if you get a green light there, after that, you can continue to discuss. And so the way the, the financial uh, institutions are given the support to a project now are willing to support investment in, in our sectors of activities start with this first point regarding social and environmental aspect. And then after, you, you have the goal now to continue the discussion. So just to complete what you were saying, not to repeat.
market between gene uh, and from the French legislation, yes, we are mandatory to report a lot of information regarding uh, all the environmental, biodiversity, and social aspects. So, Warwick, I think you wanted to come in. No? Any other questions? Yes, there's two up there. I can see. I just, uh, we're hearing a lot about <coughs> risk and cost. Um, I, I'd like to ask the, the flip side of that question, what are the opportunities that you see in, in committing to no net loss, uh, net gain, in actually contributing to biodiversity gain? So for example, uh, you know, Jim was talking about looking at the bigger picture. So when you look at a watershed and how you might preserve a watershed, instead of say putting in a uh, water treatment facility, you look at, 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 a, at a system that uh, is natural, that may treat your water and therefore provide biodiversity features. And so you're seeing opportunity, corporate social responsibility, social license to operate, as opposed to always looking at the cost or risk of your impacts. We pass the mic to the gent behind you, I think he has a question too. <clears throat> Thank you. Olaf Johansson from uh, Svea Skog, forest company in, uh, in Sweden. I'd like to, to make a comment on the uh, discussion around the IUCN report um, and also connected to the previous uh, question maybe. Um, I think that the, uh, we've, been, we've been discussing a lot about uh, no net loss and the risks and the costs but not so much about the opportunities uh, and the business cases that could be in this. And as actually one of the biggest forest owners in Europe, the company uh, Svea Skog in Sweden that I'm working for, we can see that there, is, there are actually great opportunities in this development. It's not so much about restricting the risks, it's, it's, it is much more due to shaping our company for the future. And I would say the, the, um, the first sort of wave of, of, of uh, markets for ecosystem services, we've experienced that through the forest certification that opened new markets for us and we are ready to proceed. And I think this development will open up an, uh, an opportunity to to widen the scope from, a, from, a, from timber harvesting to also include uh, natural resource management in a, in a wider framework. And that is certainly of great interest both to us as a company and also to related uh, companies, I think, in the extractive industry. Thank you. So those are two those are in interesting questions. We have heard a little bit about opportunities, you know, access to resources, maintaining a license, operating, and selling more shoes. But in terms of looking into the, into the, <coughs> looking to the long term, how difficult is that to, um, to convince your colleagues in your organisations to do? Certainly, I was at a carbon track event the other day, and a lot of finance people there, and they're saying, well. In finance, when you're in, 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 in investment, when you're asking people, look, 20, 30 years ahead, they can't do that. They can think in spaces of five to 10 years. So how difficult is it to get, to get your board to think 20 years ahead, 30 years ahead? Yeah. <coughs> yeah, maybe to explain to an example for within Friesland Campina, uh, besides the Netherlands, we have uh, quite a lot of business in uh, in uh, in Asia and in uh, in Nigeria, a very important country for us. And in those countries, we're working in our dairy development program, and we're working with farmers to increase farmers' livelihood and to increase sustainability and quality of milk. So a triangle. Uh, to get uh, the supply for uh, Freestand Campina in those areas because we want to supply more uh, uh, raw materials over there. Uh, if, we incre if we can increase the quality of the milk and we can increase sustainability for the farmers, that will increase farmers' livelihood. So then you have a business case and we believe that are the good opportunities and we, we can explain that to our colleagues from, from finance that, that is value of money. Uh, another example, in China, we started uh, last year with a cooperation between uh, science from the Netherlands and uh, the Chinese government to also to increase quality of milk in the, in the Chinese uh, farms. 
Uh, and step by step, we are finding out if we can find new business over there. So it's, it is new business development, it's strategic development, and we believe that sustainability and uh, farmers', farmers livelihood incre uh, uh, increasing is, is going hand in hand. So therefore, you can convince that is, this is long-term investments and that is uh, value for money. It was just a, a, a point around the opportunity, and I think you know the the mining industry certainly in, in, in South Africa it's a little bit different in, in that the, the the mining company itself gets a gets a license area, and if you just look at the the extent of the license areas that are that are held by mining companies versus the actual footprint area, you know I think yesterday we we were shown a couple of maps um, in Namibia and, and and a couple of other examples of where license areas are, but admittedly that isn't that isn't necessarily the actual impact. And I think there's a huge opportunity to working with, for instance, your protected area expansion strategy of the company, or of the country, is to identify those areas and those key biodiversity areas and say as an opportunity, you know, what you can do for the, those areas that are not targeted for, for mining, but are actually held by the mining company, to capitalize on that. And, you know, we've, we've certainly partnered with, with our, our local conservation authorities in South Africa around the areas, uh, the mining areas that, that, that don't form part of our, 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 our actual mining license area and have made them uh, part of our national park network and as, as well as the sort of expansion. So there's a huge opportunity, particularly in the, in the extractive industry. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I think you did mention, I mean, obviously an, an important part of, of this is uh, to the license to operate is to the ability to continue to be operating those areas to prove that you're sustainable, to make sure that you are, you know, leaving a, a positive a, a legacy in terms of, of your operations. I think that, um, you know, that, that when you go down this route, uh, the key thing is developing partnerships at a local level, and the more, uh, the, the better partnerships you can develop, in, and typically that can be local government, it can be local NGOs, it can be industry. If you're all working together for common goals, then, you know, it's actually benefiting everybody. It's benefiting communities, you know, as well. Uh, um, and we have projects, for example, where we have areas within a, a quarry that are not going to be uh, quarried for several years. So we've looked at creating bio, uh, bio, bio crops to reduce our, our fuel uh, emissions uh, on our, for example, at our cement works. And in those projects, we are creating employment for local communities. So they are actually managing and, and actually working to, to, to work with those crops. So it's got to be joined up thinking, I think, you know, by having partnerships by sort of taking, you know, uh, this sort of approach, looking at, at a net positive impact approach, it will, it will um, develop new opportunities that you'd never even thought about. So I think it's by going into these areas, whether it be water, biodiversity, whether it be job creation, whether it be, uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at building more sustainable cities, I think opportunities arise. And I think, uh, you know, it makes, uh, you know, you, you start to, to realize that uh, not only you know, can you make uh, improvements uh, with, through the products that you're manufacturing, but also you can make improvements through the actual uh, impacts you're having on, on the areas that you're working in as well. Okay. Do, you want, do you want the final word? Then we should wrap up and let folks. Oh, I just, I, I think, you know, I already articulated that for us, there's a, while there's a risk issue, you know, you can articulate the business case for um, incorporating biodiversity considerations and no net loss, either in risk or opportunity. They're two sides of the same coin, but, but on the resource scarcity, but also on the resource quality issue, which um, Yap also articulated that the quality of some of our natural, the resources that we use can be improved if we do a more inclusive, holistic, biodiversity friendly approach. And I think there's a real opportunity that there, and there's a real opportunity in innovation, also innovative ways of thinking about the way we produce materials, not only from the raw material production side, but also from the processing and how we can think about how we minimize our, our footprint. And there's a drives a lot of innovation and there's opportunity in innovative thinking as well. So there's the two sides of the same coin, but yet absolutely clear that there's some good opportunities for us in, in these approaches. Okay, well, thanks. I think you better um, better wrap up there, and I think we have a closing session and then um, coffee. But um, thank you very much to our panelists for sharing uh, what they're doing and some of their ideas. And um, I was involved in Bebop um, at the beginning till about 2008. We would have never filled the room 
uh, this size on this topic. So it's extremely encouraging to see how something has flipped in the last two years to bring this to attention of policymakers and uh, corporate um, executives. Uh, but thanks very much for coming. I think the next thing is we, um, I'm not quite sure what happened, but on, on the agenda it says we're having a convening here, but I do know there's coffee outside, so maybe if we, uh, we where, just where kind of, um, huddle outside and wait okay. to see what happens next. Can we discuss Thanks very much. Yeah.